Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about 2021 and how this will be the year of the Mark of the Beast. And in this class, we're going to show you how. To do so, first, we're going to start off by defining the Mark of our Father. To understand the Mark of the Beast, we have to understand the Mark of God. They're actually opposite. And we're going to use this information to define the Mark of the Beast next. And after that, we're going to go in and show you who actually instituted the Mark of the Beast. And then we're going to show you how things are supposed to work and how we are to keep the Mark of our Father and not get the Mark of the Beast at all. And lastly, we're going to show you why 2021, many people will be receiving the Mark of the Beast and why we are calling the year 2021 the year of the mark of the beast all right so let's get right into it now we're going to be using a lot of scripture in order to prove these points so you may want to write this information down or you might have to just go in and watch the video a second time so that you can get a thorough review of the scripture that we're using to prove these points now the first thing that we want to do is come over and look at the word sign as listed in the Bible because what we're going to find out here shortly is that the word sign and mark are used synonymously. It appears as though the word sign was used in the Old Testament while the word mark was used in the book of Revelation, but they're actually talking about the same thing. But anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's look at Exodus chapter 13 and verse 9. We see that it says, It shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. We see that it is talking about how there shall be a sign upon thine hand and a memorial between thine eyes. This is actually talking about the Lord's sign or the mark of our Father. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we'll see how the mark of the beast is also a sign on the hand and between the eyes. Well, here that we're talking about the mark of the Father, we see that what he's actually talking about is the Feast of Unleavened Bread when we look back at verse 7 and even verse 6. You see how verse 6 says that for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread and in verse 7 it says that no unleavened bread shall be found in thy quarters. And then verse 8 goes on to say, And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came out of Egypt. And then in verse 9, it actually defines unleavened bread as a sign. And when we come down to verse 16, it says, And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. Again, telling us that the celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the sign of our Father. But in this case, it's calling it a token. And that brings me to my next point, which is that the word sign is synonymous with the word token and mark. To prove that, let's come over to the Concordians and let's look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 9. Particularly at Strong's number 226, which is where it's talking about a sign. And when we look at the Strong's Concordance number 226, we see that the definition of the word is a sign. But when we look close, we see that in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 15, instead of using the word sign in the King James Version, it used the word mark. We see over here in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 15 that it's talking about Cain after he said slew his brother and the father was about to put a mark on him well we see the word mark listed here but we also see the concordance number of 226 which was the same as sign and when we come back and look at concordance number 226 we also see that it was used as token in Genesis 9 and verse 13 when it was talking about the rainbow in a cloud as a token or a sign of the covenant that the father made with Noah. 
we see in Genesis 9 and 17 that the New American Standard Bible said the word sign, but the KJV used the word token, proving that these words are synonymous. Both of them have the same concordance number of 226. But let's come over and let's look at the definitions of these three words. We only looked at the scripture which uses the three words synonymously, but let's come over and let's see what man has to say about it. One of the definitions of the word sign is an event whose occurrence indicates the probable occurrence of something else. Now, how that relates to unleavened bread is that saying that when you keep the feast of unleavened bread, then you have the mark of the Father or the presence of our Father. And it should be clear to understand that the opposite is true too. If you don't have this sign, then you don't have that probable presence or occurrence of the Father. You don't have the mark of the Father. When we look up the word token, we see that one of the definitions is a thing serving as visible representation of a fact. Again, saying that if you have that one thing, then the other thing is proven. So, by keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was declared as a token, we know that we have the mark of the Father, or the token of the Father, or the sign of our Father. And again, the opposite would be true too. Not keeping unleavened bread would mean that you do not have the mark or the token of our Father. And when we look up the word mark, we see that it is a symbol made as an indication of something. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a symbol that we have the mark of our Father. So all three of these definitions are agreeing with the scripture that the words can be used synonymously. We see that the word token is used when it comes to covenants, like we saw over there with the rainbow and Noah. And the word mark is used when it's talking about something negative, like the mark on Cain, or like Leviticus chapter 19 is talking about tattoos being forbidden on your body. So these words are all synonymous. Now, if that hasn't convinced you, let's come over and let's look at two verses. Verse 16 of chapter 13 from the books of Exodus and Revelation. In Exodus, it says, And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontless between thine eyes. Again, talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But then when we look at the book of Revelations, verse 16 out of chapter 13, it's talking about the mark of the beast on their right hand and on their foreheads. Well, that place between your eyes is actually your forehead or man's spiritual center. But anyway, in that place, we either have the token or the sign or the mark of our father or we have the mark of the beast and we've seen that it's dependent on whether you keep the feast of eleven bread or not so let's go on and let's see how this mark of the beast was actually instituted and by whom now one of the first places that we start to hear about the mark of the beast is over in Daniel and chapter 7 when it's talking about that same figure that was described over in Revelation and chapter 13 and how he would think to change times and laws. Now in verse 24 of chapter 7 it's talking about these 10 horns and these 10 kingdoms. Well this lets us know who he is actually talking about when we understand these 10 kingdoms and who they are. Now, I didn't want to go into too much detail on who these 10 federated nations are. I'm talking about them guys like the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals and the Lombards and all of those governments. If I had a better digital copy of this time chart of human history, I would be able to show you all of these people groups coming out of Rome. 
here is Rome over here and here are these ten federated nations mixed in right here you can even see that little horn as it comes out of here but again this isn't very clear and I know you guys can't see it at all the important thing that we need to understand from what Daniel was telling us is that these kingdoms or the beasts as described in the Bible all we have to do is look at the entire chapter 7 and we see that's who Daniel is talking about the great beast and the second beast and the beast with four heads and the fourth beast and the beast with ten horns the beast represents government systems so when you're thinking about the mark of the beast you need to be thinking about the mark of the government the mark of the rulers now it is over in the book of Revelation in chapter 13 that we hear it called the mark of the beast down in verse 16 but when we scroll back up to the beginning of the chapter we see it's talking about the same individuals that Daniel was talking about the rulers of the world who will be responsible for issuing the mark of the beast and to understand how they instituted the mark of the beast again we just look at the book of Daniel who is talking about the beast and how it says that they will change the times and the laws see we learned over there in the Torah that you have to keep the feast days on an exact day we see back over in Exodus chapter 13 that it is necessary to keep the feast days on the correct day year by year meaning you can't just celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread anytime you want you have to do it during the right season and at the right day so let's come in and let's see who it was that actually changed these laws and these times well if we do a search for a gentleman named Hillel too we see that he was actually responsible for changing the times Hillel too held the office of the president of the Sanhedrin during the Council of Nicaea the year 325 when Constantine was actually changing the laws you see in this image that Constantine's laws or the laws of the Catholic Church are different from the laws of the Bible that's what Daniel was talking about when he said that they would change the laws well when we look at the actions of Hillel too we see that he was responsible for changing the calendar you see here how it says fixing the calendar well fixing the calendar is changing the calendar you see how it says here that Hillel is regarded as the creator of the modern fixed Jewish calendar in other words he created a whole new calendar the calendar that the Jewish community goes by today is the creation of Hillel too not our father and Hillel's creation has been used as the calendar by the Jewish community since about the year 922 now this calendar is very similar to the father's calendar to the untrained eye it would appear as though it is the same as the father's calendar but the main difference in this calendar is that it is a fixed calendar I'll get to what it actually supposed to look like in a second but let's finish talking about Hillel too particularly why he felt the need to make this change in the first place well it was because of anti-semitism or persecution by Constantine that prompted him to come up with the idea of this fixed calendar so not only is Constantine responsible for the changing of the laws but he is also responsible for the changing of the calendar Hillel too just showed him how to do it now that website we were looking at was jpost.com 
and when we come over to worldslastchance.com it's also talking about Constantine and Hillel these two individuals are who is responsible for changing the times they modified the biblical calendar and changing the feast days on that calendar and they went on to change the Sabbath days as well that's why to this day the Jewish community celebrates their Sabbath day on Saturday while the Protestant and Catholic community celebrate their Sabbath days on Sunday well it is because of the actions of Hillel II and Constantine in their changing of the times and like we talked about earlier if you don't celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the correct day then you don't have the mark of the Father and if you celebrate it on the wrong day then you have the mark of the beast or the mark of Constantine who still rules the world through the Catholic popes and the Protestant Church today that's what Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12 is talking about when it says that it causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast even though you have this new beast that has presented himself here in chapter 13 he is still getting everybody to worship the first beast and its laws and its times and its calendar so let's see how the calendar was supposed to work if we come over to the book of Jubilees which was written by Moses however not included in our Bibles we see it describes our father's calendar in more detail than what we saw over in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14 it's talking about how our year is supposed to have 364 days in it this I believe is why the book of Jubilees was left out of our Bibles because it would have been really hard for Constantine and Hillel II to change the calendar knowing that the scripture actually defines the calendar and the way it's supposed to be so they take out the book of Jubilees and the book of Enoch hiding that information from the masses and in the absence of those facts they go on to create their own and that's exactly what they did hid the books hid the instructions for the father's calendar and then created their own calendar well notice here how it's talking about these 364 days and how if we reckon the year at only 364 days it says that we will not disturb the year or its time or its feasts for everything will fall in them according to their testimony and they will not leave out any day nor disturb the feasts so the opposite is true too if we don't mind these 364 days then we will disturb the feasts and I'm going to show you how here in a second let's just finish up with this chapter 6 out of the book of Jubilees see how it says in verse 33 that if we do not mind these 364 days if we neglect them and do not observe them according to his commandment then we will disturb all the seasons and the years will be dislodged that's an important note that we'll come back to in a second then notice in verse 34 how it says that by neglecting the 364 days the father's true reckoning of the year it says that the children of Israel will forget and not find the paths of the years and will forget the new moons and the seasons and the Sabbaths and they will go wrong as to all of the years see that's why Hillel too chose Saturday as the fixed Sabbath day was because once he got away from the father's calendar then the true Sabbath day was lost it is only through minding the 364 day calendar the father's sacred calendar do you know the true date of the Sabbath day 
In other words, by fixing the calendar, Hillel too lost the true Sabbath day. And so now people just choose either a Saturday or a Sunday, neither of which is the true Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is not fixed, just like the Father's sacred calendar is not a fixed calendar. Now, notice in verse 34, again, talking about the neglection of the Father's calendar, is telling us that we will forget the feasts of the covenant and walk according to the feast of the Gentiles and after their era and after their ignorance. And this is proof that the scripture is true because this is actually what we're doing today. When you look at the feast of Pentecost, which was supposed to be one of the seven feasts described in the book of Leviticus in chapter 23, Pentecost was supposed to be the Feast of Weeks. Well, on that calendar on your wall, if it lists the date for Pentecost, it's not telling you 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, which the Bible talks about. But we see here that the day of Pentecost is seven weeks after Easter Sunday. Easter. Easter is not a biblical holiday at all. Easter is a pagan holiday instituted in Babylon many, many years before the Messiah ever came to earth. But like Christmas, Constantine and the Catholic Church instituted Easter as a Christian holiday. And Christians have been keeping that feast day ever since. That's what Moses was talking about when he said that we would walk according to the feast days of the Gentiles and after their era. Easter is one of the feast of the Gentiles and we see that Pentecost has now been changed to be a feast of the Gentile as it is 50 days after Easter and not according to Leviticus chapter 23. Now, you may be thinking, why would the Father's calendar be so complicated? Why is it so important for it to have 364 days when, through empirical evidence, we know that the year has 365.24 days? Well, it is because of what's called the progression of the Earth's rotational axis. In other words, the Earth's seasons are changing gradually over time. And if we look at it over the course of about 26,000 years, you will see that it will actually make a complete revolution. Now, our spring time starts in about March. Halfway through the Earth's precession cycle, will our seasons be completely opposite? And we will be celebrating wintertime in June and summertime in December. Well, with that 364 day calendar, this won't happen. That 364th day is a calibration day that resets our calendar every year so that we don't have to worry about the Earth's precession. That 364th day keeps us on track. And when they fixed the calendar, they got away from the 364th day. And so now the Jewish calendar is free willing. And that's what Moses was talking about when he was talking about disturbing the feast days and how he says by neglecting the 364 days will the year become dislodged and we would neglect the ordinances by not keeping the feast days correctly. Now, another book that the Catholic Church took it upon themselves to hide from us are the books of Enoch. We read about Enoch over in Genesis chapter 5 and see how he walked with God. What that's talking about is how Enoch received information from the Elohim or the angels. This is during the time of the fallen angels who were down there teaching Cain's kids about abortion and war. Well, the angels who didn't fall like Uriel was teaching Enoch about the luminaries. Enoch wrote 366 books, one of which is called the Book of the Revolution of the Luminaries of Heaven. And we see that book starting in about chapter 71. 
all about the luminaries talking about the Sun moon and the stars well in this book we learn about their classes their powers their respective periods even their names and places and their respective months all of this information was given to Enoch by Uriel the holy angel who was with him that's what it means when it says that Enoch walked with God if you look at the better translations it doesn't use the word God it uses the word Elohim which Uriel is a member Uriel is one of the Elohim and it was Uriel that taught Enoch about the revolution of the stars the Sun and the moon and how we can use this book of the revolutions of the luminaries to calculate the father's correct calendar and we can see down in verse 42 that is also confirming that the year is precisely 364 days well here we also learn when that 364th day is when is the father's sacred calendar to be calibrated we see that that calibration day is when the length of the day is increased to when it matches the length of the night which only happens one time in a year well it is on that day when the nights and the days are equal that we have the 364th day or the last day of the year making the next day the first day of the new year well this is how our father's calendar is supposed to be calculated the problem for Hillel is that this date changes over time with the procession of the earth like we talked about this day falls on or about the equinox but if you go into the future a number of decades you'll find that the equinox will actually change and will fall on a different day this was a problem for Hillel too because you had to recalibrate the calendar every year well he got away from this by creating what's known as the fixed calendar so now the Jewish calendar since it is fixed is not based on the luminaries at all but is based on a calculation an algorithm sets the dates of the feast days not our father's calendar at all so if you've ever wondered how does the Jewish community come up with the feast days well it is according to this algorithm and that's why there's nobody to stand up in defense of it because it is an equation that dictates the days not the Sanhedrin or any other committee as long as the Jewish calendar is based on the fixed Hillel calendar the feast days are determined by a computer and over here at TorahCalc.com we can see that if we just change the years we can see that it will give us a leap year but while we're here notice that it says 2013 is not a leap year and notice that it says that 2021 is not a leap year either now coming back over here to Enoch's book of the luminaries we see that it also describes the beginning of the months this book tells us the beginning of the days the beginning of the months and the beginning of the years well we see that the months are to start at the new moon well this tells us exactly how the father's calendar is supposed to work the first day of the first month falls on the new moon that falls after the spring equinox that's the way they reckon the year for thousands of years but it was during Hillel's time that man got away from that reckoning of the year and created their own method for calculating the year the problem with this calculation is that because of the recession of the earth it is off in certain years let me show you what I mean over here at this website hebcal.com it gives us the date of the first day of the first month according to the fixed Jewish calendar 
and we see that in most years it gets it right with the first day of the first month falling after the spring equinox but you see in 2013 it didn't and it got it wrong it declared the first day of Nisan to fall before the spring equinox even as early as March the 12th now the way it was supposed to work according to the sacred calendar because the new moon of the 12th month in 2013 fell before the spring equinox 2013 should have been what's called a pregnant year with a leap month 13 months and the first day of the first month in 2013 would have started in April instead of March so in that year 2013 because of that calculation the fixed Jewish calendar predicted the date of the week-long feast of unleavened bread to start on or about March the 25th that puts the feast of unleavened bread only five days after the equinox but the feast of unleavened bread is supposed to be the 15th day of the month which would mean that the first 10 days actually fell in last year well the thing about it 2013 should have been a leap year so in other words everybody including myself who followed the fixed Jewish calendar in 2013 didn't celebrate the feast days at all we all missed them nobody kept the feast days correctly in the year 2013 who followed the fixed Jewish calendar so in other words we all got the mark of the beast in 2013 praise the Lord we lost it again in 2014 when the fixed Jewish calendar got it right good thing the father doesn't hold errors against us and hopefully after understanding this many of you won't make this error going forward but anyway let's look here closely we see in 2013 the fixed Jewish calendar got it wrong and in 2014 it got it right and we see that every year has been correct all the way up to the year 2020 so for us who was following the fixed Jewish calendar and celebrating the feast days according to it we have been celebrating in the correct month since 2014 well we see in the year 2021 that we'll go off the rails once again as the fixed Jewish calendar predicts the first day of the first month before the spring equinox like the year 2013 2021 is a leap year with 13 months instead of 12 and this is why we say that 2021 is the mark of the beast because a large portion of the world goes by the Jewish calendar when it comes to understanding the times of the feast days but that fixed calendar will predict the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover as it likes to call it a month too early so those who are following that fixed Jewish calendar are following that Hallel 2 creation will not be celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the year 2021 therefore they will have the mark of the beast so the year 2021 will be the year of the mark of the beast because in that year we can't even depend on the Jews to get it right most of them who would otherwise never consider missing the father's feast day will be celebrating them in the wrong month in the year 2021 so 2021 is the year of the mark of the beast so with that make sure that you will be celebrating the feast days for the year 2021 you see the correct days according to the correct month here 
be sure to send this information to your loved ones who keep the feast days, making sure they understand the era of the year 2021. I personally believe, like the discussion with Abraham when Sodom and Gomorrah was about to be destroyed, if only a few people do it right, then we all may be spared during this tribulous time. So let's try to get as many as we can to do it right and get the feast days on the correct day. With that, I'm going to go ahead and close out. If you got anything out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button, but leave us a comment either way. And be sure to subscribe to our channel. Hit that bell notification button because Lord willing, as we always do, we'll be putting out several classes on the feast days, including what it is that we're supposed to be doing on those feast days. In the meantime, you can search our channel for the feast day classes that we have done in the past. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.